So I've always said if you spend 13 minutes a year on economics, you've wasted 10 minutes. And, uh, <laughs> the, uh, and uh, all you need to know about the stock market is it goes up and it goes down, and it goes down a lot. And that's all you need to know. Again, it'd be terrific to know what's going to happen to the economy, but I deal with facts. If inventories are going up, if copper prices are going down, if room occupancy is going the wrong way, people building too many hotels, I look at freight car loadings, my own railroad stocks. I deal with facts. I don't deal with people tell me something's going to happen in the future. You might as well call the psychic hotline for that stuff. To, 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 to get a better average. At, uh, Thank you. Does everybody have this list? Can everybody hear me? Can everybody hear what I'm saying? There's a lot of microphones here. The, uh, this is what I'm going to cover today. So it should be on your desk. This is the, these are the key points that I, I've been using for 25 years. I think they're, they're true then. I think they're true today. I think they'll be true in 25 years. And I think that's what investing, uh, successful investing is all about. And uh, the first point is know what you own. I can't believe how many people own stocks and they couldn't describe to an 11-year-old in two minutes or less why they own this thing or what it is. The, the only, if you actually pin them down and you put a whip to them, they'd say the sucker's going up. That's the only reason they have for you. Know, uh, and this is, the kind of, this is the normal kind of company that people buy. This is a, a very simple story. I own a lot of companies like this. They make a relatively mundane product. Uh, it's a one megabit SRAM CMOS bipolar risk floating point data I.O. array processor with optimizing compiler, 16-bit dual port memory, Unix operating system, four whetstone megaflop polysilicon emitter with a high bandwidth, that's important, six gigahertz double metallization communication protocol, asynchronous backward compatibility, peripheral bus architecture, four-wave interleave memory, token ring interchangeable backplane, and they do it in 15 nanoseconds of capability. Now, if you want a piece of shit like that, <laughs> You will never make money, never. <laughs> Somebody come up with more whetstones, less whetstones, big mega flop. I mean, what do you do if this thing goes from 12 to 9? Do you, do you buy more? Do you walk around the block? I mean, do you call your friends? I mean, what the hell do you do with something like that? People buy this stuff. I mean, I buy stuff like Dunkin' Donuts and uh, Stop and Shop and CVS and made money in all those. And Sally Mae was just here, uh, you know, right before me. I mean, there's a stock I bought that. Uh, they had a great name, it was Student Loan Marketing. I mean, who would ever buy anything like that? It was a great name. If you heard the story, I think 100 people heard the story. In fact, I had dinner last night with, with Al Lohr, Ned Fox, and Paul Carey. We were all in that road show in 1983. I think if 100 people looked at Sally Mae, they would have bought it, but 100 people wouldn't look at it. Because it imagine loaning money to students. Imagine doing anything with students. At the, and uh, it was a great story. It was simple, and uh, no one looked at it. So that's the kind of stocks I like to buy. But I'm telling you, people don't do this. And I'm talking sophisticated people, unsophisticated people. They don't know what the company is. What's the story? And it's very important to know it because it doesn't always work. And uh, you have to keep posted. Uh, now, here's a big point. Remember this one. It's futile to predict the economy, interest rates, and stock market. I mean, people keep trying to do this. I mean, this would be useful. I would love to know when we get a recession. I'd love to know when interest rates are going to go up or down. I'd love to know when the stock market's going up. That would be helpful. I would like to get next year's Wall Street Journal. Uh, unfortunately, you don't get it. And I remember in 1982, we had uh, a lot of people in this room around for 82. We had 20% uh, prime rate, 15% long governments, double-digit unemployment, double-digit inflation. I don't remember anybody telling me about that in 1980. I don't remember anybody telling me about that in 1981. But in 83, I remember they said, well, the economy's bounced back when we had a recession in 85. In 85, they said we have a recession in 86. In 87, something happened in October 87. I forget what something happened in October 87. Celtics lost seven in a row. Some, something bad in 87. They said for sure we have a recession in 88. And they said 89, for sure we'll have a recession. And then 90, we're supposed to have the so-called soft landing, which we never had. So I've always said if you spend 13 minutes a year on economics, you've wasted 10 minutes. And, uh, <laughs> the, uh, And uh, all you need to know about the stock market is it goes up and it goes down, and it goes down a lot. And that's all you need to know. Again, it'd be terrific to know what's going to happen to the economy, but I deal with facts. If inventories are going up, if copper prices are going down, if room occupancy is going the wrong way, if people building too many hotels, 
I look at freight car loadings, my own railroad stocks. I deal with facts. I don't deal with people tell me something's going to happen in the future. You might as well call the psychic hotline for that stuff. To, 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 to get a better average. At, uh, you got plenty of time. This is true of Sally Mae, it's true of Dunkin' Donuts, it's true of Stop and Shop. People are so insistent, I'm that way too. I have to fight it. They have to buy a stock, let's say, let's say, let's see, it's now, let's see, it's now 501. I haven't found a stock yet today. You know, I gotta find a stock before sunset. You know, at the, you can buy Walmart. 10 years after Walmart went public, let's say you're a very careful investor. You waited. You said, I don't know if this company can make it. You waited for Walmart to roll it out. You could buy Walmart 10 years after they went public and made 30 times your money. 30 times your money. 10 years after they went public, they're only in 15% of the United States. 1.5. They hadn't saturated the 1.5. You could say, well, why can't they go to 17? Why can't they go to 19? I mean, why don't I take a leap of faith here? Why can't they go to 26? All they did for the next three decades was roll it out. You could buy Walmart. If the day they went public, you bought it, you would have made 500 times your money. If you waited 10 years in Walmart, you made 30 times your money. You got plenty of time in this business. Uh, now, the, what I'd like to talk about is what I call the 10 most dangerous things uh, people say about stocks. Uh, uh, here's a good one. If it's gone down this much already, it can't go any lower. Uh, I remember when Polaroid went from 140 to about 107, and people said, if you ever get Polaroid under 100, you've got to buy it. You just back up the truck, buy the stock. You know. uh, stock could get to 110, then rally, you know, fall 103, you go 112, go 105. They said, gets under 100, buy Polaroid. Polaroid broke 100, people started buying it, and within nine months, the stock was 18. Uh, I saw the same thing with Avon products. So just saying, you, you know, it's gone down this far, you know, how much lower? I mean, it's crazy, but, you know, it can keep going. In fact, I tried this out. Kaiser Industries, I was a new analyst at Fidelity, and we were about to buy the biggest block ever at Kaiser Industries. The stock had gone from 29 to 17. We we're about to buy the largest block ever in the history of the American Stock Exchange. We bought, I don't know, 10 or 15 million shares. At 15 and three quarters, I said, my God, the stock's gone from 29 to 17. How much lower can it go? So we bought this enormous block at 15 and three quarters. So I called my mother and I said, Mom, I guess I got Kaiser Industries, it's 10. So about three months later, I said, you ought to buy this. It's gone from 29 to 10. How much lower can it go? Well, it went to 9, it went to 8, it went to 7, it went to 6, it went to 5, it went to 4. Now, fortunately, this happened very rapidly, or I'd be working at the Stop and Shop uh, bag and behind the lines at uh, Fidelity. So fortunately, this was compressed in only about six months. So I had to go to the fund manager to say, I was a little bit early on this at 15 and 3 quarters, at, uh, <laughs> but it... Uh, we call this premature in the business. The uh, uh, had a correction, which you know is a euphemism for losing a lot of money rapidly. At the uh, uh, so I said, let's check this again. The stock's four. They own 45 percent of Kaiser Aluminum. They own 59 percent of Kaiser Steel. They own 38 percent of Kaiser Cement. They own all of Kaiser Electronics, all of Kaiser Broadcasting, which had seven TV sets. They own Jeep. They had Kaiser Fiberglass. They had about Kaiser Santa Gravel. They had a bunch of other Kaisers, and they had no debt. Now, in this room, because I know Freeman Billings is very interested in financial stocks, no one's ever gone bankrupt without any debt. Now, that would take a real, I think you have to give some kind of distinguished service award to somebody who did that. <laughs> but, uh, but they had no debt, and I said, it's not going to go to zero. You know, I was wrong when I said it can't go below 15. So we hung on, and within three years, they gave out the shares in Kaiser Steel, gave out the shares in Kaiser Cement, gave out the shares in Kaiser Steel and Aluminum, and they sold off all the businesses, and you got about $55 a share. But if you didn't know the story, and the stock went from 15 to 11, and you're just saying, how much lower can it go? When it went to 9, went to 8, you'd, you would have gone. So you can't just say it can't go any lower. Because I saw Taco Bell go from 14 to 1 in 1974, and they had no debt and making 60 cents a share. Uh, there's a corollary to that that's even more dangerous. If it's gone this high already, how can it possibly go lower? Uh, higher, sorry. that Philip Morris adjusted for splits, uh, sold for 12 cents in 1951. And then it goes to 60 cents in 1961. So it goes up fivefold, and you say to yourself, how much, this, it never sold for that, but just for splits, you say, how much higher can this go? It's gone up fivefold. They missed the power of Marlboro. They missed the, there's 220 countries in the world. They missed the cash flow of the company. They missed everything. This stock was a hundred bagger after going up fivefold. But people sold it just saying, how much higher can it go? can't go any higher. 
they did the same at Home Depot, they did the same with Toys R Us. I did the same thing with Toys R Us. Just saying it can't go any higher, it's gone this much already, that's very dangerous and don't, don't use that one. And uh, I, it's a very bad thing to do. Eventually they always come back. Here's another one that sucks. Uh, <laughs> that's a technical stock market term we just use only in the stock market. The, uh, uh, RCA just about got back to its 1929 price, was backed out by GE. Uh, Manville never came back, International Harvester, even with its name changed and adjusted for splits, hasn't got all the way back yet, Western Union, Double Knits, remember those wonderful things, uh, floppy disks. They don't have to come back, but they say eventually they always come back. Uh, not true. Uh, here's a great one. It's three dollars, how much can I lose? <laughs> this is a great one. You see, I get, get out, this is, I don't have a computer and I can't do uh, high level math, but uh, just do this one. So let's say you buy, your neighbor buys $10,000 of a stock at 50, and the stock's now at three, and you put $25,000 in at three, if it goes to zero, who loses the most? <laughs> a lot of people cannot answer this question, you know. <laughs> the, uh, I mean, if you put a billion in at three, you can lose a billion, if, you know. I mean, they blow taps on lots of companies every year, you know, you just have, they can go to zero. Uh, the, uh, here's a good one that helped me a lot. It's always darkest before the dawn. Uh, the, uh, this business is terrible. It's awful. You ought to buy the group. This is not a good way of making money. It, uh, the, uh, here's one you're probably talking about before lunch. Uh, freight car deliveries. Uh, 1979, there was 96,000 freight cars delivered in the United States. Two years later, it fell to 45,000, the lowest in 23 years. So it goes from 96,000 to 45,000. People say business is awful, it's horrible, pathetic. Then it falls to 25,000. They say, just load up. There's about 15 opportunities to lose money. There's about 15 suppliers of freight cars, 15 manufacturers. Business was awful. Well, last year we shipped 7,000 freight cars in the United States. The business just continued to be miserable. And uh, I'll give you one that's even, there's even greater opportunity to lose money on. Uh, the energy services industry. This, we all had a great opportunity to get our heads handed to us. Uh, in 1982, there was 11,000 of those oil rigs drilling left, you know, drilling those holes all over Oklahoma and Texas and Colorado. We used to have the rig count every week. And the rig count fell from 11,000 in 82 to 6,083. Then it fell a little bit lower in 84. And there's hundreds and hundreds of companies here. Companies that made the muds and did the downhole stuff, the fracturing companies, the the, the well companies, all the measuring companies, the Chambagés, the bid companies, lots of opportunities to lose money here. There's an equal opportunity, op opportunity here for serious losses. And the people said, listen, the business is terrible, let's buy these groups. Well, the rig count was only 1,000 three years ago. So it went from 11,000 to 6,000 to 5,000, then eight years later it was under 1,000. The industry really started to turn about two years ago. So just saying the business can't get worse, I, I was lucky enough, in addition to the metals industry when we started Fidelity, I had the textile industry, which is a great group to follow, because you follow companies like J.P. Stevens, who was founded in the 18th century, and uh, West Point Pepperell was founded in the 18th century. Burlington Industries is one of the new companies that was founded in 1904. And these people have been through recessions, depressions, world wars. They've seen it all. And there's a great expression in the textile industry. It's always darkest before pitch black. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now that's a good one to remember, because when business is terrible, it can get considerably terrible, it can get terrible to the power of six, and uh, it, uh, I love those numbers on freight car deliveries. You ever watch, I love the show Jeopardy, you ever watch Jeopardy and people come out, they will know those numbers, remember, they'll know the numbers, and they'll know, you know, what, uh, what country uh, Box uh, took his first vacation in, and they'll know Phil Rizzuto's batting average, and what his wife's first name was, and they'll know the stock symbols of Xerox before it was Halloid, or you know, they know everything. And you watch the show, and you feel like an absolute idiot watching the show, because they answer all these questions. But they're really smart. I own this, I've owned this stock before at King World. Right after it, they show Wheel of Fortune. And, they, and what happens is they'll have this word up there, and it'll be TH, and there's a T, and it says, I buy a vowel hitch, I buy a U, you know, to <laughs> buy an I, and, and, it, and you know, they, Vanna spins the wheel and they buy the A and, you know, you feel, you're redeemed by watching the Wheel of Fortune after you know, feeling like an absolute jerk on the uh, Jeopardy game and uh, it's really smart. It, uh, uh, when I rebound to 10, I'll sell. Uh, here's a great rule. Uh, somebody buys a stock at 10 and it falls to 6. They say, if it gets back to 10, I'll sell. Now, I think the math, 4 and 6, I can handle this level of math. 
I think that's about a 66% return. You ought to buy it. If you think it's going back to 10, you ought to buy the hell out of the damn thing. But they think if it gets back to 10, I'll sell. Now, what you ought to do is never put down a round number. Because I think for the next 26 years, the stock will go between five and nine and a quarter. It'll never get to 10. <laughs> so maybe put nine and eighth or eight and three quarters. But just saying the stock, if it gets back to what I paid for it, this is a very important rule. This is, a very, this is one of the key rules. The stock doesn't know you own it. <laughs> Remember that. You could be a miserable person. You could have, uh, you know, never helped anybody, never done anything right, had 67 spouses, never done anything right. If you own Coca-Cola the last 50 years, it's gone up 300-fold. You could be the greatest human in the world, help Special Olympics, help the mentally challenged, help poor people, help AIDS people. If you own Bethlehem Steel, it's lower than it was 30 years ago. It's not your fault. Don't take this personal, you know. <laughs> but people treat stocks sometimes like they're grandchildren or a puppy. I mean, they, they, they think, they think the stock knows who you are. You know, it's, you know, it doesn't work that way. It, uh, uh, let me worry, I own conservative stocks. Uh, I don't have to worry, I own conservative stocks. I remember when Con Ed fell 80% uh, then tripled uh, Public Service Indiana, went down 90% Gulf States Utilities, Long on Lighting. This may be an oxymoron. We had quality Texas banks that went to zero. We had uh, <laughs> quality New England banks that went to zero. Uh, these were companies that have been around for 150 years, 120 years. Saying I own conservative stocks, I don't have to worry. And I've seen a lot of people, they'll inherit a stock from somebody. They'll say, you know, my mother said on her deathbed, don't sell the Long Island Lighting. You know, you always wonder, you know, is it, she's going to heaven or hopefully where she's going to heaven. You know, they talk about a Little League game or a vacation or a game of hearts they had or... Imagine talking on your deathbed about Long Island Lighting. And you say, well, you know, <laughs> but you get these stories all the time. And I think your mother would have noticed she wouldn't have sold at 29, but she, wouldn't, she would have noticed they had this little plant that was about six billion over budget, and no one wanted it, and uh, wasn't working, and uh, Long Island stopped growing. So maybe she would have turfed it at 22, or got out at 18, she wouldn't have let it go to four. You know. So just because you inherit some stock, and it's so-called conservative, like Eastman Kodak fell 75%, IBM fell 75%, don't tell anybody you own a conservative stock. Companies are very dynamic. I don't buy that argument. Uh, here's a very dangerous one. Look at all the money I've lost. I didn't buy it. it uh, people do this all the time. They say, I didn't own Blockbuster. I didn't own Home Depot. I didn't own Toys R Us. I, uh, Eric it was very nice to say some nice things about when, when I came up here. And Manny has been nice to me. I laid one of my books listed on two pages. In the 13 years of Ray Magellan, I listed, uh, I think, about 200 stocks, A through L, on the New York Stock Exchange. They went up tenfold or more that I didn't own. Well, I ran with John. I had owned lots of stocks. I listed 200 stocks A through L. I stopped at the letter L, and I didn't own any of these shares. They went up tenfold or more, and I was able to do okay with Magellan. And people worry all the time about missing Microsoft, missing Western Digital, missing uh, United Airlines. They spend all their time worrying about stocks they miss. You cannot lose money in a stock you don't own. That's a very important. You have, the only way to lose money is buy a stock, have it go down, and sell it. That's the only way. And I swear that people, that their spouse has to cut out the newspaper in the morning, cut out the C's, and the person will look at the M's, oh my god, Microsoft's up, up three, you know, I had, I was going to buy a thousand shares of Microsoft, I lost three thousand Microsoft last night while I was sleeping, you know. <laughs> the, uh, you know, I was going to buy seven thousand shares of National Semiconductor at ten, it's now seventeen, I just lost forty-nine thousand dollars on <laughs> National Semiconductor, they do this all the time, I mean, they have to cut holes, the block, thank god, Blockbuster finally went away, because that would be early in the alphabet. People would always be looking how much they lost in Blockbuster. Uh, I missed that one. I'll catch the next one. That usually does not work. Toys R Us, there was a lot of copycats of Toys R Us. There was Trial World, there was Lionel, there was copycats of Home Depot. Buying the next of something usually doesn't work. It's, uh, it's very bad. It's like buying on dips. I think it's always better to buy from dips. I always thought it was a better rule than buy on dips. <laughs> you may have to explain this to some other people. Uh, this is another technical term you may have to explain after hours what a dip is. The, they usually refer to it as plurals, dips. I never heard dip. You know, he's a dip, she's a dip. They usually only the plural tense for it. So it's a, and it's a gender nonspecific. It, uh, it's usually plural. Dip is never used. Um, uh, stock has gone up, I must be right. Stock has gone down, I must be wrong. I am convinced that people do this all the time. They buy a stock at 10, they buy a little bit of it, 
It goes to 13. They now say they don't know anything more about it than they knew when they bought a 10. They have no idea what this company does, but it's gone to 13. Now they take a second mortgage in the house and buy it at 13. The best thing that can happen for us is to go directly from 10 to 4 for these folks. You know. It's going to go to 4 eventually, but it goes to 13 in the middle. They're convinced now they bought 100 shares at 10. Now they buy 20,000 at 13. And uh, all the fact is the stock went from 10 to 13 is it went up. The average movement of a stock in the New York Stock Exchange this century, between its high and its low, has been 50%. The average stock in the New York Stock Exchange. That means the stock started the year 20, sometime during the year sold 16, sometime during the year sold at 24, might have finished the year 21, might have finished the year 19. The average range of a stock in the New York Stock Exchange is 50% in 12 months, between its high and its low. So stocks go up and down a lot within a year. And say this, the stock is going up means you're right, doesn't mean a damn thing. So don't buy off on that one. It, uh, that is not a good one. The, uh, avoid long shots. Uh, these are the companies that, uh, we have this very technical term for this uh, called whisper stocks. The, uh, everybody familiar with whisper stocks? They're, uh, they're great. Somebody call you up and they'll say, hi, Peter, how's Carolyn's? How's Beth doing? How's Annie? How's Mary? Have you played any golf? And then they'll say, I want to talk to you about international blivet. And uh, the next they will get you know, one of those, they'll get a shorter term in those places where they, they have Nordic tracks and they uh, put them away and they don't, they don't have to make <laughs> big rocks into small rocks. They just watch movies and they have Nordic tracks, but they, won't, they will not get these people if they whisper in the phone. And these are always these long shots. You know, these are the stocks that are going to uh, grow hair and uh, make your kid have better spelling and your breath's going to improve and you won't have to iron your pants. You know, it's one of those stocks, and they always do everything for you. But they're missing. They don't have any sales yet. You know, that's the missing element to the story. The story is sensation. <laughs> There's no profits here, no sales yet, but my god, if this works, if this works, it's going to be the next Xerox, you know, and, uh, and it's going to help Murr and Space and everything. You know, it's a very, very good deal. Now, this is not a long shot. This is a no shot. You have to separate these out. I've tried 30 of these. I have never broken even on a long shot. Never. I've made 25, 30 times my money on some stocks. I never thought about Sally Mae or MBIA or Fannie Mae or some of the banks or Stop and Shop. I'd make 20 times my money, 30 times my money. I had no idea. I thought the stocks were going north. I had no idea. You look back 10 years later, you say, my God, I made a lot of money in this thing. The ones I went into thinking I could make four times my money, I've never broken even. So don't do the long shot, guys. They don't work. It, uh, the, uh, they, simply don't work. Uh, and again, if a stock's three and it has huge potential, write down the story, take the stock symbol. If it's going to 300, it's okay to buy it at 15. Check in later. Check in a year later. See if it's still listed. See if it's still get a quote on it. See if they still have any earnings yet. <laughs> but if it's going, write the story down. Some of these work. I haven't heard yet, but maybe they will work. But it's worth tuning in six months later. Don't buy it then. It, uh, uh, Importance of management. Uh, management is the single most important thing in a company. But for an outsider to know great management versus good management versus terrific management versus average management, tough to do. Tough to do. Because you only get an hour at people, sometimes a half an hour. And uh, how do you know what decisions they didn't make? A lot of great companies have been made because the company didn't make an acquisition. They didn't get rid of the division. They don't put in the end report. We didn't get rid of the tubing division. You know, you don't hear about that. Somebody said, made a brilliant decision, we're going to hold on to that thing, we're going to fix it, and it's doing great. Now, they might be doing great because some management eight years ago did it right, or some did something right five years ago. That person isn't there anymore. Or they didn't make any acquisitions. Or they expanded at the right time. So knowing what management, what they can add to it, it's the single most important thing, very hard to measure. I've always said, I'd like to have a company any fool can uh, run, because eventually one will. And uh, <laughs> you really want to do that. When I bought Toys R Us, they had the formula right. Any four people in this room and me could have run Toys R Us. We wouldn't have done as well as they did. They're spectacular. But for the next 15 years, we had no competition. We had a great formula. We could have rolled with it. They probably would have done three times as good. They were the frosting on the cake. But they had the form they're right, no competition, the department stores know what they're doing, there was no copycats, and they were going to just roll for the next 25 years. Same with Circuit City. So I want the story to be solid. If management can add anything on top of it, that's great. I want to buy the story. Assume management leaves the next day. 
and they're replaced by the next generation. That's fine with me. If management can add something to it, that's great. I'm not going to buy it because people say they have great management. Because you'll notice great management is always attached to stocks been up the last eight years. You ever notice that? Because I looked at Reynolds Metals. I used to follow Reynolds Metals. The stock has had the same person run it for like 30 years. When, st when the st aluminum was tight, they'd say Reynolds Metals has great management. Aluminum going over supply these people are idiots. Then aluminum get tight, they say these people are terrific. I mean, it all to do with the price of aluminum. And they keep rating the management by how the stock's doing. It's very hard to measure management. It'd be wonderful to do. If you could spend months with them, really see them in action, then you'd know. But you don't really get that chance. Uh, be flexible. Uh, people have all these biases, all these prejudices. They want to buy high growth industries. They won't buy financial companies. They won't buy savings and loans. They won't buy uh, companies that start with the letter R. I mean, I, you know, there's all these rules. They all hurt you. There are great stocks everywhere. There are stocks that are near bankruptcy, stocks in bankruptcies, stocks about to go in bankruptcy. There are companies on the new high list that are attracted. This company's on the new low list. They're all over the place. They're in growth industries, non-growth industries. Don't cut yourself off to one segment. People have way too many prejudices, too many biases. And I always thought of it, I, I don't know the women in the audience uh, see this many times, but I always thought of these buy lists at some institutions. We don't have this the fidelity. They have these buy lists. I think Kmart got on, on some of these companies' buy lists three years ago. You know, with the, Microsoft may get on it about 12 years from now, but they, they have these buy lists. And I always thought of the buy lists as, uh, you know when you buy a new shirt, you, you ever look in the pocket and you get inspected by six or inspected by eight? Do you ever see those numbers? I mean, I always wondered about that. I always think of those buy lists at those institutions where I see that inspected by six and inspected by eight. In fact, I'm absolutely, if somebody call me, I, you could do it any time of day, has anybody ever got a shirt inspected by one? I mean, do they retire these numbers? They have a meeting. I've never had a shirt inspected by one or by two. I think they must put the, they raise their numbers in a meeting up to the rafters. But I always think every time I get that number in the shirt, I think of these people working off a buy list of rapidly growing companies, only they have unit growth rate of X or 6X or whatever the number is. It doesn't work. Uh, the, uh, another thing about it is, is math and the kind of math you need to do this. I don't use a computer. I don't have a computer. Uh, I really was doing great math. I was, I remember 7 times 7 was 41, and 9 times 9 is 81, and you know, 12 times 12, I think it was 144, so it was some big number. Anyway. I got that one down cold. And I said, this is great, I love this stuff. And the barge left St. Louis going at 8 miles an hour, and the train left Pittsburgh, and ha, huh, this stuff is easy. And I remember one day, I think it was ninth grade, it was a grim day, somebody introduced cosine. God, that day, I mean, remember cosine? I mean, is, has anybody used cosine the last couple of years? I mean, in this, you know, the, uh, let's have a show of hands. How many of you have used cosine the last six months? But I, I remember tangent and cotangent. Why would you want to know about tangent? And then remember the area under the curve? I mean, remember that crazy your calculus, the area under the curve? I mean, what the hell would you want to measure an area under curve for? You know, the, uh, that is such garbage. You, know, you don't need this for the stock market. If you can, measure, if you can add 8 and 8 and get fairly close to 16, that's all you need. You know, you say, 400 million in debt, no equity, no cash, losing money, forget it. You know, they get 300 million in cash, no debt, 200 million in net worth, they're losing 10 million a quarter, but they'll be around. That's all you need. You have to get, that's all you need. That does, is not that hard. If you made it through fifth grade math, you can handle this stuff. And I had a, a roommate in the Army, and uh, it, uh, it's a story I always remember. He, he, was, he was talking about, he went to this very good school in, uh, in the South, that I won't tell you the name of it, but it's in Atlanta and it rhymes with Roger Reck. The, uh, and they had this, uh, my hero uh, at the school uh, was a very good football player. This is, this, is, this is my friend, my roommate, telling me the story about this guy who was a freshman at this great school. And he'd go to the line of scrimmage and they'd change the play. He couldn't figure this out. You know, I don't know if you realize how complicated football is. Half the plays are changed in the line of scrimmage. It's about 300 plays. You go there, think it's a run to the right, it turns out it's a screen pass to the left, or it's a draw. It's all the blocking assignments have changed. All the passing is different. You, can do, you have to instantly think, uh-oh, new play. What do I do in this new play? Just like that, and do it. He could not handle these deals. He says, give me the ball, I'll tote it. And he'd go for about eight yards. He was really good at this. <laughs> now, this is not why he's my hero. The reason he's my hero in a, in a classroom about this size is freshman year. He asked the question, does x always equal 7? <laughs> The, uh, now, he, 
He never made it to the second semester. He never, <laughs> he never made it to the varsity. He never made the NFL because he, that damn X, he never could figure out X, you know. The, uh, and I always thought at the UN, they could, they could resolve what the hell X equals. You know, they could say, if it's 247 and a quarter. You know, they just finally resolved what X was. We could save all this time and do something useful, you know. You don't need it in the stock market. But, uh, okay, now we'll get to the important stuff. There's always something to worry about. But, uh, this is the difference. This is what happens in the stock market. Because, see, everybody's got the brain power to do well in the stock market. The question is whether you have the stomach for it. That's the key organ in the body. There's always something to worry about. I grew up, I went to school, grew up with a kid in the 50s. In the decade of the 50s, there's this is big theory that the depression was caused by a stock market crash. Totally wrong. Less than 1% of Americans owned stocks in 29. We had this big time recession. In fact, it was a depression. That's what, it wasn't caused by the stock market. We, the economy went down, the Federal Reserve raised interest rates, and we had a big time depression. In fact, we had several depressions like that from 1850 on. We had, this was only one of about eight depressions since 1850. But people, in the, people thought the only reason we got out of the depression was World War II, and they said, once we get back, next time we have a recession, we're going to have a depression. And it's going to be a great depression. I never understood that adjective in front of depression. Now, it ought to be crummy depression or bad depression, but it was always great depression. I never quite, quite understood that one. The, uh, so people weren't buying stocks in the 50s because they thought that another great depression was going to happen. In addition, people were very scared about nuclear warheads in nuclear war in the 50s. People were building fallout shelters, stocking canned goods. There's something about going to Vermont, building a fallout shelter, putting canned goods in it, that you don't buy Minnesota mining or you don't buy East Dakota. I mean, just, the syllogism just doesn't work out that you're buying uh, lots of water, buying a shotgun, buying frozen food that, that will stay in the freezer with your own generator, and you're looking at growth stocks. <laughs> doesn't seem to work out that way, you know. And I remember in the 50s, I mean, I remember literally in classes, I was in elementary school in the 50s, and they would come in, they'd have one of these air raid drills, somebody with a yellow hat would come in, they'd blow a whistle, and you'd get under your desk. Even then, I said, I don't think this is going to do a lot of good, you know. It, uh, <laughs> the, uh, but people were worried about a depression in nuclear war in the 50s. And then, they, I mean, the, the warheads, they couldn't do much damage back in the 50s. Now, one of these Stan countries, you know, these Kakistan and Kazakhstan, all these Stan guys that have spun off these these Friedman building spin-offs from the Soviet Union, the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, they didn't lead it. It was a co-deal with somebody else, like <laughs> Goldman Sachs, and they, uh, they, they were on the left side, though. The, uh, uh, every one of these little countries has enough warheads to blow the world up 88 times. I mean, who's built a fallout shelter lately? You know, we stop worrying about it. I mean, there's always something to worry about. In the 50s, it was depression and nuclear war. The 50s was the best decade this century for the stock market, except for the 80s. Only slightly better. These are only slightly better. People didn't expect a lot. We had an okay, it wasn't a great uh, decade. They just didn't expect much. We made it through. And the uh, stock market was terrific. Uh, do you remember when oil went from 4 to 40? Remember that, remember that period? Oil went from 4 to 40, and the experts said it was going to go to 100, and all the countries of the world were going to go bankrupt. And then and the big banks going to go bankrupt, and we're going to have a Great Depression, and the stock market's going to go down, and you're going to wind up selling pencils and apples. You know. The, uh, well, I remember oil went from 4 to 40, and the experts said it was going to go to 100. Within two years, oil was at 14. The experts, now much higher paid at this point, are saying it's going to go to 4, and we're going to have a depression. <laughs> and people believe it again. You know, the, uh, I remember when the money supply was growing too fast, and they said we're going to have a depression. Then it was growing too slow, we're going to have a depression. Remember the LDC debt? Remember the LDC debt, all the banks? Our banks were very smart. They lent all their net worth to Zimbabwe, and. Botswana and Bovatsawa and all these countries, Chile, a lot of countries they can't pronounce. This is Chase Manhattan and Chemical and Manufacturers Hanover. These countries weren't doing so well. Then they were called undeveloped countries or less developed countries. Now you have to call them emerging countries. It's not politically correct to call anybody an undeveloped country. It's like I just found out the other day the, the term for somebody that's overweight is laterally challenged. You have to say something like <laughs> laterally challenged. The, uh, but these are LDC debt. They're all going to go bankrupt and we're going to have a depression. Uh, then the Mideast was going to own the world, remember that one? The Mideast was going to own the world, they weren't going to buy our bonds, and the market crashed and we'd have a depression. Then Japan was going to own the world, remember that one? Japan was going to have all the assets and they weren't going to buy our bonds and we're going to have a depression. Within three years, the Nikkei Dow had gone from 40,000 to 16,000, the banking system was in trouble, and people said Japan was going to collapse and we're going to have a depression. <laughs> I mean, people had 
on their prayer list at the end of the day, they had eliminated crippled children and Mother Teresa, and they're praying for Japan. I mean, you know, it's a country with a 15% savings rate, you know, it's some bizarre, you know. Commercial real estate, global warming, uh, you know. And I think it's the older you get, the more nervous you get about these things. I think it's very viable. I think while younger people are better investors is they're not worried. They haven't heard about all these crises. And they're with children. I think if you don't have any kids, you ought to rent some kids for the weekend. You know, get a seven-year-old and ask him if he knows about the money supply, you know, how fast it's growing. Ask him if he knows about the shape of the yield curve is the wrong shape of the yield curve. Or that we're 48.3 months into the economic recovery and the average recovery's last 52.3 months. You know, ask an eight-year-old if they know about that. Eight-year-olds have a very high expectation about the next 20 years. That's what you need to do. The more you get away from eight-year-olds, the more you get away from 11-year-olds, the more you start reading these crazy things you read over the weekend. The, uh, in fact, from 1955 to 1985, the stock market uh, went up a grand total of 1,000 points, but it was down 800 on Mondays. So it was, down, it was therefore up 1,800 on non-Mondays. It wasn't an accident. The stock market went down October the 19th, 87, was a Monday. People over the weekend become economists and portfolio strategists. You know. <laughs> I mean, they're a bull if they take their lunch on the way to work. You know, to the, in fact, I knew very well the market was going to go down in October of 1987. Uh, Dave Elson remembers that. It was my first vacation I was going to take in six years. And we decided to go to Ireland and uh, we stayed at all these little cottages and play golf. And, I left on Thursday after the close of trade, the market was down 55 points, which wasn't a good start, but it was down 55 points. And we got over there, and because of the time zone, we were able to do what we wanted to do and get down to Cork and called in the market was down about 118. And I said to Carolyn, if the market was down on Monday, we better go back. But we're already here, so uh, I was going to stay for the weekend. So as you know, the market went down uh, 508 on Monday, so I flew home because my fund had gone, from, I think, from 13 billion to 9 billion in two working days. And I, uh, <laughs> it was, uh, the trend here is not positive. Like, I could do something about it, you know. You know. The, uh, but there's something when they called, they wanted to say, well, what's Lynch doing right now? Well, he's on the 10th hole. He's even part of the front nine, but you know. He's in a trap right now. This could be a double bogey. This could be a quadruple bogey right here. It could, could blow the entire front nine right here. You know, this is not what they wanted to hear, you know. It, uh, uh, so I have no idea when the market's gonna go down and, uh, no idea when it's going to go up. I'm totally shocked. The market was 4,000 two and a half years ago. A little while ago, it's 8,000. Uh, I had no idea about this. Uh, very surprising to me. But I'll guarantee you, the market will be a lot higher in 15 years. It'll be a lot higher in 25 years. What it's going to do in the next one or two years, I don't have any idea. And if somebody in this room knows about it, they're not telling anybody. <laughs> or they're not in this room. They're down in Palm Springs somewhere. You know, the, they've made a billion dollars. Or if they know anything about interest rates. As an interest rate, if you can be right five times in a row in 10 grand, you can have two billion. It's not that many people with two billion. There's a lot of people predicting interest rates. Did you ever think about that one? <laughs> the, uh, just five times right in a row in 10 grand, two billion. It, uh, if you're right seven times in a row, you can have the GNP of, uh, you know, the United Kingdom. You know, it's a big number. It, uh, uh, so I don't worry about that. I know we've had uh, 96 years of century, and the market's fallen 53 times. We've had 53 declines of 10% or more. So 53 declines in 96 years. Once every two years, we have a 10% decline. Of the 53 declines, 15, one five, have been 25% or more. So 15 in 96 years, about once every six years, the market falls 25% or more. That's what we call a bear market, you know, you know that. And it's gonna happen. It's, I don't care when it's gonna happen. I would love to know. I, obviously, it would be very useful to know when it's gonna happen. It doesn't make a difference to me. Corporate profits will be a lot higher eight years from now, a lot higher 16 years from now, a lot higher 30 years from now. That's what I deal with. And I'll be glad to answer your questions. It's been great. Uh, enjoyed it. And uh, I want to start the questions. If they don't get the question, I'll read the calendar of offerings for Freeman Billings for the next month. <laughs> Do you like international stocks? The uh, uh, question is, I, always, I found I was better overseas than I was domestic because there's just less coverage. There's less people following these companies. So I think my big theory, and I think it's valid, if you look at 10 companies, you'll find one that's mispriced. If you look at 20, you'll find two. If you look at 100, you'll find 10. The person that turns over the most rocks 
wins the game. Overseas, the numbers are much better. There's just not that much coverage. So I think international stocks are definitely worth looking at. When do you sell stocks? When you sell a stock is exactly the reason you buy it. You write down the reason you bought it. I bought Subaru. Subaru was a distributor. They didn't, they didn't, make any, they didn't actually make the cars. I think it was Fuji Heavy Industries made the cars. They distributed uh, Subarus in the United States. The stock was, uh, I think the stock was 80. It was up from 6 to 80. I was a little late on this, but I didn't bother me, and I should never let that bother you. I didn't let it bother me. They had $40 a share in cash. They had a very low-priced car. It was well-liked. And it did well for about five or six years, and I think the stock went from 80 to 320. But the reason I sold Subaru, thank you. The reason I sold Subaru is Hyundai came in with a low-cost car. Chrysler cut the, cut the price of Omni Horizon. Ford came out with a low price car at the end. All of a sudden, the Subaru was no longer unique. If the, if the car's not a buy, the stock's not a buy. That's what you're looking for. The reason you buy a stock, you keep it posted. If the reason changes, you go on to something else. Uh, what industries do you like best today and why? Uh, no idea. Uh, what's your favorite stock investment today? No idea. Uh, what I'd rather tell you is there are lots of great stocks out there, and you'll find them. I mean, I could recommend a stock, and three months later it could go up or it could go down. But the great stocks, I mean, imagine if you worked, I mean, I worked in the investment business. I missed Franklin. I missed Dreyfus. Franklin went up 300-fold. Dreyfus went up 50-fold. I didn't miss Dreyfus twice. It was my industry. When Dreyfus went in the crash, this is bizarre. Dreyfus went from 50 to 30, and the crash had fell to 18. They had $17 a share in cash and no debt. It was selling for one. I did that math very rapidly. And the week of the crash, there were like 90% uh, money market assets and bonds. They, their assets didn't go down the week of the crash. The stock went from 50 to 18 with $17 a year in cash. So I, I paid attention to my own industry. Imagine you've been in the retailing industry. You would have seen Home Depot. You would have seen Circuit City. You would have seen all these great companies. These people are buying biotechnology stuff. It's uh, crazy. The, do you believe the S&P 500 market is expensive? Yes. Uh, which industries look the most attractive now? I would say... If you look at the secondary stocks, we've had 3,000 companies come public the last four years. That's two a business day, 3,000 companies. One third of them are lower than the price they came public at. Some of these are not great companies, but some are good companies and they had a glitch and no one cares about them. So it's the secondary companies to me is the research list. That's where I'd be looking today. Uh, uh, let's see. If you believe you should not owe what you own, please discuss the pros and cons of concentrating your estimates versus diversification. Okay, very good question. I don't believe in diversification at all. I, I would own one stock if I could find one great stock. Diversification is a big mistake. I call it diversification. But the, you buy this thing that might balance this other thing and they both go down. It, uh, <laughs> my God, I got enough questions. I got enough questions to come at your fifth annual conference here. My God, you, <laughs> I, think we have, I think we have enough conference growth. Thank you very much. Oh, that's a pretty big one. The, uh, so I don't believe in diversification at all. I would own one stock. But what I do believe in is if I find 10 good stories, they're all equally attractive, I buy all 10. And I wait to see them unfold. It's like watching 10 poker games. 10 games of stud poker. You watch the cards turn over, story three gets better, story six slips, story seven stays the same, but it goes up 50%. So you sell seven and buy two. That's all I do. So if they're equally attractive, I buy all 10. Then gradually some story says, oh my God, this is getting better and better, and guess what? The stock just went down. So you keep watching 10 stories, and magically, because of that rule of stocks going up and down a lot, then you load up. You really you know, take a big advantage. So that, that either happens because something happens to the company, or the market goes down and all stocks go down. Will you please, please cause writing articles on mutual fund conversions? Oh, cease. Cease writing articles. I'm not going to cease writing articles on mutual thrift conversions. It's a, it gets me mad that 99% of people that have deposits in a thrift, when it goes public, this thing comes to them, throws it in the trash. I mean, they don't even look at it. I mean, it's, it's sad. They don't even consider buying it because they're used to getting something from a savings loan that gave them a calendar and a free toaster. I mean, they're not used to something that has, you know, 75 pages of black ink and they have to put money up. So I'm still trying to educate the public to take a look when thrifts come public. Uh, if you believe what you should know, you should own, you should know. Could you discuss the pros and cons of cons? Oh, I did that one. That was a great one. Uh, I love my answer. What's your opinion of Wayne Huizanga's style? Great style. Okay, uh, yeah. <laughs> the, uh, 
Uh, statistics show women control most of the money in the U.S. Where are they at this moment? No, where, no. Uh, there's some male that's trying to find these rich women. They're, where are they at this lunch? Okay, all the women at this, okay. Uh, the, uh, why are there some men trying to drill them? No, do, uh, <laughs> looks like drill them, I can't believe it. Oh, tell them what to do, okay. Uh, don't know, I, uh, I've got three daughters, we've specialized in that gender and they're great and uh, they're bright as hell and I think they're gonna be terrific. So I don't know why there's so many damn men in this room. It, uh, it, uh, I think it'll even out over time. It takes a little while to catch up. I remember when Harvard Business School and Wharton had no women in it. Now they're 50%, so it's working the right way. Barton Biggs says we are in a bear market rally. Do you agree? I don't have the freaking idea what rally, schmally. This is bullshit. <laughs> Try to, total bullshit. The, uh, the, uh, now here's something, Manny Freeman. I mean, listen, Manny Freeman said this morning they're in the fifth inning of the current bull market. This is also bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> is, uh, the only difference, this is more current bullshit. No. Uh, uh, okay. How many banks will there be in 10 years? Okay. Uh, we still have 7,500 deposit takers in the United States. In, in England, they have seven commercial banks. They have three building loan societies. They have a total of 10 deposit takers. In Canada, there are eight banks in the whole country. My town, we have over nine banks. I have a little town of 18,000. We have nine banks in our town. We have 7,500 deposit takers in the United States. We count credit unions. They all have their own audit, their own advertising jingle, their own software systems, their own board directors. I mean, unbelievable waste. So how many banks will there be in 10 years? A lot less than there is now. You know, how many thrifts will there be? A lot less. This industry is going to have a serious consolidation. There's an unbelievable redundancy, waste, duplication, and it's going to shrink. And it works. Now these stocks are up. They use paper. It doesn't cost anything to do it. But, uh, okay, that's it. I appreciate it very much. Thank you.